Uh, welcome to, I think it's live. Welcome to Impossible Conversation. I'm your host, Suki, and your, my goal is to introduce you to the ordinary people that are doing extraordinary things, inspiring you and me and others to follow our dreams. Dalai Lama said, just as ripples spread out when a single pebble dropped in the water, the actions of individuals can have far-reaching effects. Our impossible conversation is all about you and your story. Your story is unique and so, so different and not worthy of a comparison. Tonight, my guest is Dave Algeo, speaker, writer, podcaster, and well-being coach. He has a passion and interest in male mental health. So I'm going to welcome Dave now. Hello. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. I don't know what's wrong here. Because it was just fine before, wasn't it? Oh, it? Can you hear oh, me? Okay? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Good to speak. I'll just introduce you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Writer, podcaster, speaker, <laughs> mental health coach. Yeah. Specialized by men's health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's it's um, the the podcasting, writing, and all of that kind of thing is the means for me of reaching the people that I'm interested in helping. I mean, I want to help everybody if I can, but you've got to kind of be you've got to be realistic. You can't reach everybody, can you? So, but I'm particularly mm -hmm. interested and passionate about engaging with blokes. Blokes like me, blokes who probably like me have struggled in the past to to break out of this, the kind of expectations that the role of being a bloke or a man can put on you. And um, for me, it's about how do you how do you break that? How do you mm -hmm. break through that so that you can you can actually find out who you are, not who mm -hmm. society or culture or whatever kind of dictates who you should be and for me so the podcasting the writing the speaking and all that kind of thing is is all about how to how to get those messages across okay uh, can i just quickly check because um i've just got a message from les saying it's quite echo there, there was an echo and just wondering if it's still echoing or not is it echoing on um, my side yeah. hello gaya uh hey k mala is it Echoing over there, like at Facebook, because we are streaming in a to a different program. Like I have no reply, so probably okay. -ish. Okay, yeah, the male mental health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So I get. I guess it kind of ties into my own personal story which kind of dates back a, a long time I suppose when I was a kid growing up um I've always felt a bit out of step with the world I guess with um you know found it hard to understand the world and probably the world found it hard to understand me um as somebody who was kind of more introvert and quiet and pretty shy and socially awkward I kind of grew up thinking that there was something wrong with me and a lot of my way of coping and dealing with that was to to work hard to fit in, to fit into whatever, you know, friends, upbringing, you know, school school friends, all that kind of thing was to kind of get you to fit into a certain way. And that worked. It worked to help me feel part of something, I guess, you know, um, through school, through universe, uh, college, and then onto my job as a police officer for a lot of years. Um, and I think there's a point where, you know, actually conforming and trying to be somebody you're not, it can be useful protection, but there's a point where, I guess, in life where you realise, hang on a minute, life's too short for this, and uh, surely there's more to life, and surely I'm not as, you know, the real me that's behind this facade isn't isn't as bad as I think, isn't as bad as useless, or bad or as useless or as inept as I think, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So... The journey for me started, must be 15 or so years ago now, when I started to really think, is this it? There's, there's got to be more to this. You know, I'm going to spend the rest of my working professional career as a police officer 
um, but also as a husband and as a, a family man and just a bloke um, being not me. And actually, mm-hmm. who am I? <laughs> who Who is this person called Dave Algio? Um, and back then, you know, I think 15 years ago, there was self-development. There's still, you know, there was a fair bit, but not the, to the extent that there is now. And it certainly wasn't something that an, as a northeastern bloke, um, you could access easily or talk about easily with anybody, really. Um, so I kind of struggled with that, but started that journey, you know, reading books. There wasn't podcasts back then, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It wasn't this kind of thing. Um, and you kind of bimble through or I did bimble through my own journey of self-discovery, I guess, uh, making lots of mistakes and taking, I would say, you know, good 10 or so years to really start to find my feet with it. And in amongst that, that's when I started to realise at the heart of it, what I love to do is to write and communicate and teach. And um, I guess the conversations that interest me more, so the genuine conversations with people, men or women, who are potentially in the same predicament as me, or as I was then, you know, as um, somebody who is thinking, come on, there's got to be more to life than this. How can I how can I break through and be me and find out who me is? So that's kind mm-hmm. of the journey that I, I've been on in the last 10 or so years, well, 15 years now. Yeah. And if you think, is was there like anything triggered you to think that way? Like 10, 15 years ago, what was that trigger moment? I, I think there's a couple of things. I think one of them mm-hmm. was um, my, um, I've got three children now, um, mm-hmm. but one, my son Thomas, um, when he was about four year old, he, he, he kind of stomped into the kitchen to his mom and said, God, dad's in a bad mood again, isn't he? And it was that, mm-hmm. that was one of those points where you think, yeah, I am in a bad mood. And, and do you know what? That little lad's never seen me in a good mood. He's mm-hmm. four year old and he's not seen me in a good mood his entire life. And it was one of those points where you sit, start to think, you know what? I'm taking it all too seriously. There's something I'm trying to be this and that and drive myself to some some other standard. And actually, I'm losing the joy and I, 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 I've forgotten how to smile or laugh. And it was one of those mm-hmm. points that you think, yeah, I am taking it too seriously, and surely there's more to life than this. Surely life isn't all about the grind, if you like, and the and the trying to to get somewhere. Now, mm-hmm. I'm I'm very much, uh, you know, as a coach <laughs> and a speaker and trainer, I very much believe in setting goals and and having some sort of vision for where you want to to head towards. But I also think, what about now? You know, what about the here mm-hmm. and now? And um, not sacrificing the here and now and enjoying the moment and the. the the precious times of my son who was four year old growing up right in front of my eyes and and Mm -hmm. not missing that and it was one of those moments where you think come on Dave we we need to do something about this and you know it wasn't an overnight fix there was no quick turnaround it was a bit like turning a tanker in the you know in the ocean it it took a good while um, Mm -hmm. and a bit of trial and error finding the right um support coaches reading sources of material that help me move in the right direction if that makes mm-hmm. sense yeah because and uh your technique to help others are uh, it's not just a normal one isn't it <laughs> yeah I, I mean ultimately i guess what i'm very before i go into the the things that i use which i know what you're talking about um Mm -hmm. what i what i recognize is that i think and i think most of us as human beings think in metaphors and we kind of tell ourselves stories we tell ourselves stories about ourselves, about other people and each other and the world and those stories are kind of what dictate how we navigate life and in the stories we kind of have metaphors and comparisons so it's like this it, you know life is like a box of chocolates as um, Forrest Gump would say you know we we're always com- creating these metaphors and I remember when I was starting my journey kind of looking and researching and reading particularly around stress because for me stress is about it's the thing that gets in the way of who I want to be how I want to feel and where I want to go um, when I was reading and researching about stress and the physiology of stress, the the fight or flight and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. an analogy struck me or a, a memory struck me rather. 
mm-hmm. um, of a children's program from a good few years ago, Cracker Jack. And for those who may be listening or watching who remember Cracker Jack, this was a kid's program on the telly quite a long time ago. But on there was a, ch- a game called Cabbages and Kings. And um, I'm not going to go into explain it fully, but basically the mm-hmm. children would compete. They would answer questions and they would get prizes. And if they got a question wrong, they'd get a cabbage. If you got three cabbages, you were out. So that mm-hmm. kind of builds a picture. And as I imagined that whilst I was reading this material on stress, I kind of thought, yeah, that's quite a good image of how we get bogged down in life. So you have the prizes. And in my case, I use cuddly toys to represent the good stuff. So the prizes are the good things in life, the things that you want in life. And the cabbages are the booby prize or the demands and the challenges, the good Mm -hmm. thing. Sorry, the good challenges that you take on in order to have the good stuff, but also the demands that aren't so good, the smelly cabbages, I call them. Um, And you're carrying around a bunch of good stuff, but on top, life puts cabbages This demand, you know, workload, um, financial worries, relationship issues, all sorts of things, caring for for an elderly relative. You you love them, but Mm -hmm. it's very demanding when somebody's struggling with dementia and what have you. So these challenges are mounting, and we can lose sight of the good stuff in life because we're too busy dealing with the challenges and the demands, the negative demands and the cabbages, those, mm-hmm. you know, as that game represents. So for me, that's that's the metaphor that I use. Um, I use it in my workshops and my speaking, but I also use it in my coaching because it's about mm-hmm. what are the challenges that you're facing and how can you kind of identify them and separate out your cabbages, you know. So when we're feeling really, really stressed, we often don't see individual problems or challenges. We just see a big pile of them coming down on us. And the challenge mm-hmm. really is for us to step back and identify the individual challenges. I've got this financial issue. Work is being really hard. I'm, I'm experiencing this bullying ex- issue at work. Um, you know, financial. There's lots of different challenges, but we need to separate them out and deal mm-hmm. with the one that needs our more attention the most, you know, right now. And that's a that's quite hard. Well, it's really hard when you're under stress and overwhelm. So I kind of use that as a metaphor to then build in tools to manage overwhelm, to help mm-hmm. slice the cabbage down, chunk that yeah. cabbage into sprout-sized actions. Mm-hmm. I've I come into the phrase, you know, are you sweating the right sprouts? Because actually, as human beings, we love to sweat sprouts. And the sprouts represent things to do, actions conversations the moment by moment experiences the thing is we would rather often when we're facing challenges sweat the wrong sprouts which is the i'd rather go on facebook or scroll through my emails than face and deal with the stuff that will help solve the challenge or the problem or move me forward so it's about asking ourselves at any given time am i sweating the right sprouts so that's kind of the metaphors that i use for that my yeah. son but it's kind of the metaphors that seem to work when people kind of get them, you know, to work with. And it's very different, and you can really see. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I yeah. really love that. And yeah. could you explain me about what do you classify as a stress? Yeah, um, what is, right. What is actually stress? Yeah, this is one of the things about the word stress. It's um, It's got a lot of baggage, um, so I tend to stick with the fact that we have a stress response. So the stress response is what happens to us, our psychological, emotional, and physical response, when we perceive a a demand or a pressure. So it could be something outside. You know, I'm walking along and I see something, um, you know, don't dwell on the image, but if I'm Caveman Dave a few hundred thousand years ago, if I saw a threat like a saber-toothed tiger, Mm-hmm. then my instincts and everything will be saying this is a threat and it will ki- activate my stress response yeah mm-hmm. so yeah. my blood starts to rush around and go to the parts that need it like my legs and my arms hopefully my visual focus will get very acute and focused on the threat so that's the stress response doing its job but it's more than that because your stress response is what helps you survive but it's also what motivates you and gears you up to meet challenge so not everything that is demanding is life-threatening but that stress response has come to you know i've got a deadline i've got this to do i've got that to do 
It's what motivates that physiology and that emotional response to get you to do the thing that needs to be done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your stre rather than thinking of stress, the stress response, in effect, is your survival mechanism, your mm -hmm. fight or flight or freeze if it's extreme, and your motivation mechanism. It's what gears you up. It's what gets you out of bed on a morning, basically. Because mm -hmm. it's um, exactly the same chemical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's the same yeah, combination mm -hmm. of chemicals. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, they're, there are yeah. different hormonal signatures in there, depending mm -hmm. on it. But yeah, on the whole, it's the same combination of chemicals and release, etc. Um, mm -hmm. And that stress response in the moment can be very mm -hmm. acute, depending on how how str strongly we feel that stress that pressure that's facing us is. So if I'm mm -hmm. facing something that I think, oh my god, this is terrible my stress response is going to be, whoa, right up here. Mm -hmm. But if it's kind of, oh, I've dealt with that before, it might just go here and mm -hmm. it gears me up. Now, that might be right. It might be right. It might not be the appropriate stress response. Up mm -hmm. here may not be the appropriate stress response because somebody's just asked me, could you just go and wash the dishes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, whoa, you can't ask me that. Why me? <laughs> yeah, because our stress response is not uh -huh. about the, the reality of the threat or the stress. Mm -hmm. It's about how I perceive it. Do mm -hmm. I think that is something that's genuinely challenging, threatening, and and demanding of me? So, so you're right. Yeah. So it, it depends on the level of that response. But one of the biggest challenges we have in this day and age, I think, is not so well. Yes, the acute stress response is a, is an issue because that can send us into overwhelm. But underlying it, we live in a world that's always on. So what we have is this chronic level of the stress response activating so we we uh, you know we're always connected emails and notifications are always dropping into our phone mm -hmm. or into our inbox into our desktop um we're always we always feel like the world wants something of us and we're always mm -hmm. we're adding stuff in here like yeah. I've got to be, mm -hmm. i should be i need to be i've got to be there and i've got to do this and you should be and things should be we're adding lots of stress so what that means is that our stress response is activated all of the time almost so it might mm -hmm. not be in the peak state yeah overwhelm but it's in that chronic level here and when we're experienced chronic stress for any length of time that's when we really can we can experience the long the short well the medium to long-term effects of chronic stress can become negative you know in terms of our mm -hmm. yeah. mood mental health physical health and well-being and emotional well-being as well so what can we do about it? Right. Well, there's what a lot of things. Your method? <laughs> what uh, yeah, is sorry, your time? Um, yeah. Well, again, this is this is kind of where I I, I like to talk principles using the metaphors of the cabbages but uh -huh. and the sprouts and what have you. I think the big thing is firstly is to know and recognize what is you, what does you look like and feel like, sound like, behave like when in that period of overwhelm but also chronic stress so what happens to you when you're feeling overwhelmed and that's a common thing to ask for, mm -hmm. for us to have experienced for me mm -hmm. i can feel my head starting to spin i feel panic rising i feel that voice in here getting louder and louder saying you dave you're useless it'll ne not work out you know those kinds of things mm -hmm. but if i know that then I am better in, in a better position to catch myself when it happens. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So the first thing is yeah. to, to know what stress, overwhelm and overload chronic stress is, then to recognize you when you are experiencing it, because we're all different. I mean, what, yeah. what happens to you, uh, Sugi, when you feel overwhelmed? What, what, how would you describe it, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I don't think I go overwhelmed that easily. Oh, yeah. Because um, I just don't take things seriously, right. I guess. Right, <laughs> right. That, that's a yeah. good. It's a good strategy for starters. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. maybe I would go and probably just not good enough. Right. That would be the thing. Yeah. Okay, so that self-talk in here is starting to mm -hmm. say it's starting to get a bit louder. Yeah. <laughs> This is one of the first steps is to sort of start to reflect on when I'm feeling. And this is where I, I kind of step away from the word stress, because I think there is a lot of baggage around it. But when you when you feel the strain, when you feel like 
things are on top or you feel like you're struggling there's lots of different words where i can't cope mm -hmm. or I'm to cope. Or to, god it's so hard use that language instead of stress because that's a more practical down to earth way use the mm -hmm. language that works for you but when i feel like i'm struggling to cope i start to get that voice that says you're not good enough or you, mm -hmm. you know if you can identify yeah. those signs that's the first mm -hmm. step then the next step is when as and when it happens is get better and it takes practice but get better at catching yourself when you're doing it to yourself mm. so i've learned over time that when that negative voice gets louder that's me feeling the pressure mm -hmm. and the pressure tipping from positive to negative if you like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so once you can start to catch yourself you're then in a position of control and power because you can do something. If you don't spot yourself, you've got less mm -hmm. options, haven't you? So, yeah. Yeah. So when you can spot yourself, you can then say, right, mm -hmm. hang on a minute. Okay. And really the first things, if you're, if you're in that position, the first golden rules are step away. You know, if you can create some space in that moment, and sometimes it's not possible. I mean, I, as a police officer, I've been in positions where you, you know, you can't leave a situation or, you mm -hmm. know, uh, NHS emergency staff and all sorts of different yeah. people they yeah. have to stay there so but the first thing is if you can step away just create some space from the thing that's creating the stress or pushing your buttons or however you want to describe it mm -hmm. step away go put the kettle on <laughs> go mm -hmm. for a walk um, yeah. go to the toilet you know whatever just create mm -hmm. space yeah. mm -hmm. because that space helps your brain get that distance it needs to go mm -hmm. okay right and then i then talk about give yourself a rescue breath because i, I just talk about like your breathing is a great tool for just bringing your your, your emotional temperature down if you like the stress level down so that um that breathing technique can be used if you step away and go put the kettle on you can breathe and just what have you or if you're in the moment and you can't leave a few seconds of just controlled constructive breathing can be really really powerful and i talk about the rescue but there's loads of different techniques so i'm not claiming mm -hmm. that the answer yeah, yeah. what i would suggest is slow down your breathing and try to move your breathing from up here you know your shoulders because mm -hmm. what we can do is carry our attention yeah here. Mm -hmm. yeah like mm -hmm. yeah that's instinctive because it's almost like I've got to protect myself, mm. that kind of thing, or I'm going yeah. to run. Whereas actually the mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive, but what we need is kind of drop our shoulders and then just breathe into our abdomen, you know, the abdominal breathing. And I I, mm -hmm. I like to give things that are memorable. So I talk about the rescue breath being 224. Mm -hmm. Rescue breath 224. Breathe in for two, hold your breath for two, mm -hmm. breathe out nice and slowly for four. Okay. two two four in your own time you know i do talk through it in a workshop and just demonstrate mm -hmm. but in your own time breathe through two two four so you've stepped away you've given you so you put the kettle on and, thought, oh, and then you go and you're counting through two two four and the idea of that mm -hmm. two two four is two things one is you're engaging breathing in a slower way mm -hmm. The other is you're distracting yourself, not just by your breathing process, but by the counting. And the ca by distracting yourself for that from those few seconds, you're giving your brain microseconds or seconds to just go distance. Let's just think about this because your brain's an amazing thing. It's an amazing piece of kit. Mm -hmm. It really is. And we need to get the best out of it. And the one way, the way to get the best out of it is to give it a few seconds of space. You know, in the highest stress moments, um, you know, in the times I've experienced it in kind of police work, but also work with doctors who are working in the emergency room, ER rooms and things like that. They have stop moments in the emergency rooms where they'll say, right, OK, let's just stop for a second. Uh, because they know the value of a second pause in the critical times, because if you carry on and your stress levels are just winding up and up and up, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do something that is critically and critically wrong and, and possibly irreparable. So if they can do it in an NHS emergency room, then we can do it in our day-to-day -day lives. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Actually, that just stops. Step away if you can. If you can't step away, just go silent and do two, two, four in your head. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to say, mm -hmm. give a second, mm -hmm. two, two, four here. 
Mm -hmm. You don't have to advertise it. You just yeah. say right in your head, two, two, four. And that helps create that distance. Because all we're trying to do in that moment of peak overwhelm is just bring ourselves down. It's not solving the problem because the problem mm -hmm. is still there to be solved. But in mm -hmm. overwhelm, we're not in the right place of mind to solve it. So we need to bring ourselves down to get to a better position where we can deal with the challenge, the cabbage, the thing that needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that overwhelm is how we do it. So step away, remove from heat. I like to talk about it. You know, if you might mm -hmm. take a pan, a boiling pan off the, the stove, it's only going to continue to boil if you keep it on the stove. Take it mm -hmm. off, rescue breath, and yeah. then get some perspective. And then start to assess is this thing that's in front of me a big or a little thing? And that's kind of thing because many of us would you would you agree kind of when we're stressed we tend to overreact mm -hmm. things yeah because it's often not the real cabbages or the real da demands and problems in our life that cause us to tip over the edge mm -hmm. it's a small thing it's that yeah. one thing when you you had a deer from hell and then somebody just comes up and says could you just do this one thing that's what tips you over the edge and actually that becomes the problem, not the stuff that you've had building up all day. So what I like to talk about is a very simple question. It sounds silly, but it's, is this thing that's created the stress caused me to feel overwhelmed, cabbage or sprout? And simple question, but the idea is, is this thing that's making me feel overwhelmed, is it a big thing or a little thing? Mm -hmm. often it's a little thing. And if it's a little thing, let's just recognize it as a little thing and tell ourselves, don't sweat that sprout because that little thing does not deserve your attention or your your reaction that reaction the cabbages deserve your attention and the reaction mm -hmm. that sense? yeah uh, yeah so i guess that's in terms of overwhelm it's recognizing that often we get overwhelmed because we're already carrying around a load of demands in our life we're carrying around you know getting the kids to school and back from school getting to work on time you know and everything builds up and it just takes one little thing to, to light the spark mm -hmm. and to tip you over yeah and uh sorry yeah for you nope. uh-huh yeah because when you talked about the little sprouts and the cabbages and it sounds like we if we if we keep giving lots of attention for everything, we'll be ended up getting stressed. Yeah. And that brings us to this book, oh, which yeah, right. is I've yeah. learned very first from you. Right. The four hour work week. And I remember yesterday we were talking about it. You said when we give just a few hours, like more priority, yeah. then we will be even more productive. Yeah. That it's just like made me think about the sprouts and the cabbages as well. Yeah. Because if we've got like longer hours, we try to do everything yeah. and like small stuff that's no much effect. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that, need... that, mm -hmm. that book, I'm guessing, probably be familiar to a few to a few people who watch The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Mm -hmm. The title is um, it belies the content because really, I don't work a four-hour week, work week, and Tim Ferriss doesn't work a four-hour work week. Mm -hmm. But the principles there are to recognize that when we're working, and, and, and it relates to a lot to well, work and life, but how often are we just trying to do everything? We're trying to do, we're trying to deal with every cabbage and sweat, every sprout, every little last little thing, spend mm -hmm. every moment doing everything because we need to get that list finished. We need to move forward and complete that project and everything needs to be done and actually we that becomes a habit and when we're talking about stress that's when we start to get really sunk by it you know mm -hmm. um, and for me the four I work I read it years ago but and I, I read it every year as a reminder but yeah. uh, what became a particular priority for me a few years ago was when my little daughter Rosie was born mm -hmm. I uh, you can tell I'm not a young lad <laughs> um, when she was born I realized that when she turns 21 I'll be 66, God willing, if I'm still here. Um, and what what will I be, what will my health be like? What, you know, all of those things were going around my head. And I realized, you know what? I teach this stuff. I teach the cabbages, the sprouts, and I teach how to manage stress and develop your well-being and invest in self-care. And I do a bit of it. But I realized, you know what? 
I'm not playing a long enough game. I'm not thinking far enough ahead. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. three to five years, but a lot of my thinking was about like, oh, if I just get this, I'll get there and then it'll be fine. I realized, you know what? If I carry on doing and living in the, the, the hamster wheel, the drive, the constant pressure I was putting myself under, I'm not sure I'd be there at 66, but also not fit at 66 mm -hmm. when, when Rosie turns 21. So what, what I kind of started to think was, hang on a minute, right? I, 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 I believe in the philosophies of the four hour work week, like the underpinning stuff. I'm not saying the four hour work week, but I mean the, the philosophies of stop working for a deferred life plan. And what Tim Ferriss means by that is we're many of us are thinking when I retire, when I pay that debt off, when I get there, life will be. Mm -hmm. What about right now? Mm. And I'd fallen back into that myself. Mm -hmm. that. And also that not every activity you do or undertake has an equal value in terms of moving you towards your goal. And that's the difference between sweating the right sprouts because we're, there's loads of tasks to do. There's lots of things we can do in life. There's lots of cabbages we can go after, slicing, dicing, and chunking down sweating sprouts. There's lots of things we can do. Mm -hmm. But there's only probably a few of those things that actually make you, that actually move you forward to your goal, that count. I call them the sprouts with the most clout. Mm -hmm. The actions that will move you forward more than the, the trivial stuff. And as a recovering perfectionist, I want to do it all. And it has to be <laughs> perfectly. And I don't know if anybody else relates to that, but I think this is the pattern we can fall into. And I, and when Rosie came along, I decided, you know, I had a chat with Leslie. Um, Leslie's a, a solicitor, and um, she wanted to go back to work and look at it, you know, develop and continue her profession uh, career. And I thought, you know what, this is an opportunity. So I, I kind of I said, right, how about go back to work, you go back to work, I'm going to continue my business, but what I'm going to do is work a three-day week for the next few years, whilst Rosie's young and not a, nurse, a baby and not at nursery and what have you. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see, I wanted to treat it as an experiment. I wanted to see if what I thought just there was actually true, that if I limited the time that I had for work, mm -hmm. that I would get more thoughtful and careful about how I spent that time. Because one of the things I learned um, when I was working in the police and running my business at the same time was that I didn't have in uh, lots of energy and lots of time to dedicate to building my business. So I learned that actually I had to prioritize what I did to, and make it count. And it was the same when Rosie came along and I had a three-day week business. I thought, right, I've committed to this. I'm looking after Rosie Monday and Friday. And... My mum will look after her one day. We'll have a friend, childminder for a couple mm -hmm. of days. Those three days need to count. They need to really count. So my challenge was, how do I make them count and not just maintain my business, but grow my business? And it was about really picking the cabbages that I needed to focus on. What are the, what are the mm -hmm. demands, the priorities that I need to make to, to do, to deal with, that will move me forward or protect me from damaging my business um, mm -hmm. and just deal with those cabbages now that's easier said than done but it is about thinking about it and making some tough decisions and it's like if you if you're short of money let's be right if you're mm -hmm. short of money yeah. you get careful with money don't you mm -hmm. the same with time if you're short of time and now yes i'd self-imposed it but you get careful with your time and you think right is this something is this activity doing social media posts, lots and lots and lots of them, going to really move me forward? And the answer for me was no. Stop doing them and focus on sales, um, customer relations, and developing excellence in my product. Those mm -hmm. were kind of priorities. Um, and as such, it helped manage the stress of the overload because if I'd had five day a week, and for many people in business, it's not a five day a week; it's a seven day a week, isn't it? Let's be right: it's seven days, nine till midnight, whatever. You, you know, yeah. you work, you work all the hours you can. Mm -hmm. Don't get it wrong; I still fall into that, you know. And there are weeks when it is like that. Yeah. But when you're in that, you you work on anything and everything. But this created that constraint where I said, right, no, I need to focus on this, this, and this. And everything that I felt I needed to do or came in 
does it fit? Does it work with this? Yes or no? And if it wasn't, it didn't get done. And that in itself is quite a hard thing to manage. It's a hard thing to learn when you're somebody like me who is a perfectionist. But it was really useful to, as a discipline. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of that. I guess that's where that book um, built. You know, I, I kind of was testing it out for myself, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it worked. Yeah, wait, wait, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah, messy. Yeah. You know, yeah. three day week sounds great, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. know, there were days when it was all over the place or weeks mm -hmm. when it was all over the place. But on the whole, um, yeah, it's been good. It's been it's been a learning experience as much as a as a, a great experience. I spent some great time with Rosie growing up. I really have some had some quality mm -hmm. time, but I've had to learn. I've had to learn how to not work. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. And yeah, this is a question because I wonder how many of us, because we're we're full on, life is full on. We f we forget how to truly stop and be present in the here and now. And mm -hmm. I remember sitting in the early, you know, the early days with Rosie. You know, she, when she slept a lot, as babies do when they first mm -hmm. they sleep during the day, but not so much during the night. <laughs> 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 but when you know when she's sleeping, I'm thinking, oh, she could be asleep for an hour. I might just go and check emails. I might just do this. And I had to stop. I said, no, that's, you know, and, and the discipline around that. Mm -hmm. came saying, no, hang on a minute. Remember what you're doing this for. And that was, that was hard because it was the habits of busyness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where I, I think a lot of us struggle. We're, we're looking for an answer on how do I manage overwhelm and stress? And I think there are useful tools and tactics. There's lots of things that can mm -hmm. help. But ultimately, if you really want to make a difference, you've got to go inside here and go under the hood into your head and start looking at the thoughts and the stories you tell yourself, the habits that you have, and how do you break the make new habits that are le that are more constructive? Yeah. You know, do you know what I mean? Yes. And that's the, that's that's the hard really work, really. isn't it? That is the it hard is, work. It's really, really hard work. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, because. Uh, but, mm -hmm. Well, all I was going to say was, it's the hard work, but it's the best work. It's brilliant, you know. I mean, I, I suppose I'm speaking for somebody who loves this stuff, mm -hmm. but and I still, you know, I still, I still catch myself. My brain is very devious at trying to trick me back into some of the old habits, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of in a place where I think, ah, got, ah, I see what's happening here, and I'm kind of better at catching myself now. But it becomes a bit of a, I, I enjoy it. Maybe I'm just mm -hmm. one of those weirdos, but. Um, Rather than seeing it as hard work, I see it as mm -hmm. oh, this is an opportunity now because if I can nail this one, if I can really break this one, I, you know, move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of how you frame it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how did you change your habits? <laughs> um, well, there's no quick fix in my view. I mean, I know, mm -hmm. you know, some people may have different views, but um, I remember, I can't remember who gave this analogy, but I've, I've kind of used it. It... it I play the guitar, and um, if I, you know, if I'm playing it and the strings are a bit worn and old, then I need to think about changing the strings. And if you think about the worn and old strings, they re they relate to our habits. You know, they've served their purpose, they've done their mm -hmm. job, but they've just got dull. Or you, no matter how much you tune them or clean, they're not going to work. You need to change the strings. So sometimes it's about identifying the habits that you think, right, I really do need to focus on that. And really, it's about picking one habit. Don't don't try and change it all overnight. It's mm -hmm. a long game. Let's play the long game. You, you live, yeah. Life's an ultra marathon, not just a marathon. So let's not try mm -hmm. and sprint it. Let's pick a string, change that yeah. string, and work with that. But just like, let's, you know, that guitar, I put fresh new strings on it. Just because I put fresh new strings on it doesn't mean that I that it doesn't need retuning every so often or regularly. Mm -hmm. My guitar, even sitting in the room next door, needs a tune every time I pick up and play it. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Or if okay. I move from a warm room to a cold room, it needs a tune up. And mm -hmm. I think that's the same with our habits. You know, we will nail something i mean i've done it myself I'll kind of nail so i've got that cracked that's probably the time to worry when you think you've got something cracked um but when you when you've got a habit you think right yeah i know what i'm doing here i'm this is this is my um all or nothing mindset kicking in again right i've, re I've got this nailed everything changes around you it's like the change of the environment for the guitar you need to think hang on a minute i need to retune this because 
I'm going to fall back into that habit. So it's kind of, it's ongoing work is what I'm saying. You've got to constantly be practicing, playing, looking out for when it's out of tune, tune it back in. And sometimes you need to replace the string. Yeah. That's and again, I'm using like, metaphors, but ultimately mm -hmm. it's about awareness. Catch yourself when you're having the habit and then getting back to the things that helped you. And for me, it was challenging it and saying, right, hang on, Dave, you've done it again. I'm not critical of myself. I've learned to be mm -hmm. compassionate mm -hmm. with myself. But that's not helpful. Let's do what is helpful. And kind of mm -hmm. the self-talk shifts. Yeah, so it's just like being very, very self-aware and then know what you're doing. And, oh, actually, I yeah. I caught you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, caught yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but the other thing is also not being so, I mean, I'm not like Mr ultra vigilant on it i'm not mm, yeah, yeah. self-aware because that's exhaust mm -hmm. it's just recognizing days or weeks or months might go and i suddenly think oh, mm -hmm. i've had it recently over christmas actually or christmas is it for me it's a good time to just have a bit of downtime and you mm -hmm. think yeah yeah you know it's been a good year it's been good but you've slipped a little bit in your driving yourself forward and your head's gone to it'll be better when again dave do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So mm -hmm. during the year, I might not have spotted that because I'm in the thick of it. But when mm -hmm. I just have that quiet time over Christmas, and it's a lesson for me that I need to con continue building in the quiet time more regularly, but having that quiet time makes you think, yeah, you've fallen back into a little bit of an older habit here. Mm -hmm. Let's get back onto that. Let's focus on that going forward. So it yeah. is constant work. But for me, that's the that's the... That's the juice. That's what's great about life. You know, you catch yourself and you work on it. And and I guess that's what I love when I work with people as well, you know, with mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. It's yeah. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, what, what do you think about, because I there, there are kind of a newish trends coming up because it's prioritizing things depending on energy level. Are you morning person or evening person? What's your most productive time? and prioritize like high priority stuff in there and it's it's quite new newish thing have you ever yeah. done anything like that yeah I, I, i'm not sure it's that new i think these things come That's in and out new for me. well no no you're right but uh -huh. I, think coming out with it, I mean in terms of um body clock you know our circadian uh, yeah. rhythm, there's good science and i i always go back to the research i, I can't you know i'm a self-confessed nerd when it comes to this stuff but I'll go mm -hmm. there is good science that suggests some of us are more orientated to be you know early risers and some of us are more orientated to be late risers and, and perform better later in the day etc you know it's it, it's an individual thing so mm -hmm. you know I think you're right it's about in your journey of learning what works for you catching yourself in those habits when am I most productive it's about for when are those times for me first thing on a morning uh, you know this miracle morning not knocking it it's just not for me <laughs> i am not a morning person and yet somebody uh -huh. could argue well that's because you're telling yourself that uh -huh. yeah fair dues. but i've tried it and all i found was I, I got up for half five for a long a good few months actually half five i was very productive at half five in the morning for the, for an hour and a half uh -huh. but i noticed over two months doing it that my mood had dropped right it was not making me happy uh -huh. so it's about look at what people suggest what's the advice that people give and i try to steer away from very specific things i know i'll give you the rescue breath but um take things experiment with it if it works great keep it in the toolkit if it doesn't don't beat yourself up as it's your fault because it's not it's just mm -hmm. not for you. put it over there and try something else and build up so you're right you know if you're a morning person get get crack and do what works for you if you're if you're mm -hmm. not a morning person do something that doesn't you know that doesn't need the best of you until mm -hmm. you are at your best and when you're at your best that's when you do the stuff that really matters yeah so for me yeah. writing and creativity does not come first thing on a morning i'll tell you that <laughs> coffee comes first thing on the morning for me <laughs> yeah because i kind of tried the morning thing as well yeah. i got friends who just come up at five o'clock and does everything and but when i get up at five o'clock in the morning <laughs> it just it's just like like that one click and it's seven already and i don't feel like i'm doing much in that time yeah yeah but because after midnight 
if I'm sitting down and working, I I'm like night owl. There you go. I yeah. feel like I'm really productive. Yeah. 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 And that's and interesting. You could retrain yourself. There, you know, mm -hmm. there is a suggestion that you can do that. But why? If it works for you, and it works for you, and you're happy, mm -hmm. why? There's no point, is there? Just do what works for you, and if it's enjoyable, do what works for you. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Of being hard on yourself, there is no yeah. point. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I think yeah. there's a big part of that is there's enough energy required of the things that will move you forward to your goal. Don't mm -hmm. waste it on being hard on yourself. <laughs> there's a it's time to be disciplined and say, come on, I need to get on. Fine. Mm -hmm. Don't waste it on constantly beating yourself up because you're not up at 5 30 or you're not doing this or you're not doing that. Mm -hmm. That works for somebody else. Yeah. It's about working about what works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Those are sprouts, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the sprouts can mount up if you keep chucking them at yourself, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we've nearly gone like about 45 minutes. Oh. <laughs> and when I asked your favorite quote, you said, your plane small doesn't serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. Yeah, I love that quote. I first heard it when Nelson Mandela gave his inaugural speech. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a Marianne Williamson quote, so he he quoted that, um, and um, it just it just struck a chord with me because I think I spent I don't I don't know I think how many of us do this? We grow up into this world where we try to fit in, and part of that fitting in is to dampen down or hide the stuff that you are really excited about or passionate about or interested in or good at and mm -hmm. uh, i spent a lot of my time apologizing for being good at st certain things i'm not good at everything by god no but i'm good at certain things but mm -hmm. it wasn't vogue to be interested in chemistry or biology or you know it just you know that was swatty you know um mm -hmm. and i learned that you hide the stuff that you're good at and you fit in and that that quote just gets the heart of that because when you do that and you you fit in you are you are playing small it's not mm -hmm. about being some massive big player in the world like elon musk or arguably or whoever Mm -hmm. What it is about is being you and playing big in being you and not mm -hmm. playing, not hiding the things that you've got, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I suppose that's a quote that I have, um, yep, just down there, across there on my wall there, because it's um, something I need to remind myself of, and I think many of us do. Stop it. Stop playing small. Stop hiding. Stop holding back. Stop apologizing for not getting up at 5 30 in the morning, you know, <laughs> even if it's just in your head. Just mm -hmm. be you and be all you can be and just be out there and just do it. And, and just enjoy yourself. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you make you'll make the most impact. Even if that's mm -hmm. with the people closest. In fact, that's probably what matters the most. The people who are closest around you. If you're the real you, God, that's what they want. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of my that's my view on that quote. That's why it kind of really does resonate with me. And I've often joked about getting a tattoo on me back of that one. I haven't quite got around to that one, but yeah. <laughs> one day. I'll tell you. On one your day. on your what is it? The stag do? <laughs> it's very <laughs> long. <Yeah. laughs> no, I'm not there's not gonna be a hangover style stag do on that. <laughs> I'm not gonna do. <laughs> oh, that's <yeah>. <laughs> That's quite yeah. a long quote. So <laughs> it is. I'm not sure. I'll turn. I'll turn up drunk with this, like the back of me. Oh, cross me back. Like. <laughs> no, I won't be doing that on my stag do. In fact, I'm not having a stag do. Funny. Enough. <laughs> I'm gonna have a quiet couple of drinks with some family and friends. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm really bad. <laughs> when I start laughing and it's just like don't stop, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> it's been absolutely amazing to have you as my guest. Dave. Well, it's been yeah. lovely, it's been lovely to talk to you, and obviously, I, I, I love our connections anyway over the time, whether it's <laughs> PSA or wherever. It's good to good to catch up, and I hope I made some sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking sprouts and cabbage. I hope I have made some sense. Yeah. I'm sure because you're going to speak on on Thursday at the World Network yeah. as well, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of along those lines um, mm -hmm. that I'm going to be talking about. You know, this I the idea of yeah, yeah, kind of how do you shape a life more towards where you want? You know, not not the quick fix idea, but the you know, you deserve to to push in the in the direction that you want rather than just being dictated to by life and fitting in and all of those things. Excellent. So if anyone wants to see it, Dave, <laughs> on Thursday. <laughs> yeah. With me sprouts and me cabbages. Uh. <laughs> yeah, sprouts and cabbages. Yeah. Okay. But okay I, well, we'll thanks talking. very much and yeah. thank you everyone who's joined us. And we'll see you next Sunday. Bye bye. Okay, bye. You, see you bye. See you bye. Bye.